Wanderer, The Ultimate Hippie Trail Journey is a great read and a hell of a lot of fun. Check it out. Follow the journey and our route on our website at wandererbook.com. Wow, it's week 40. 50 years ago, we're looking at this week by week in one year journey that I took in 1970 to 1971. Look at that road. That's the way it was up, up, up the Himalayas to the Valley of Kathmandu. And it was an incredible journey and it really took a lot out of me. I tried to avoid it by getting on a plane, didn't work. So boom, boom. Anyway, we get to Kathmandu and my whole life changes. I finally get to this Mecca, this place I wanted to go for so long, this place that was a vision to me, that was the end result of Larry Glazer's map to get from Istanbul to Kathmandu for $28. I made it. We are weary and we get on the bus and the bus ride is scaling the mountains after a very short period on the plains, sliding around in the back seat of a bus, falling asleep from painful lack of sleep and my head literally bang into people near me and steal bars. Yikes. July 3, 1971, Saturday. It's morning, the city of Kathmandu, a closed American Express, eating eggs, potatoes, and bacon, delicious. Then I'd run into Don the Canadian who we lived with in McLeod Gunge at the Tibetan Memory. Wow. We head off towards the Dairy, a famous spot amongst Western travelers in this part of the world for its cold milk and Western style hard cheeses. While I'm there, a Swami gets a hold of me with blue studded ringed eyes and he starts hustling me to convince me as to his validity and powers. Although a bit of a street hustler, he somehow captivates me although I'm trying to escape and return to my friend Don and the dairy products. The Swami has a business card, which identifies him as Swami. He wears a turban, is light-skinned with a gray beard, yet clearly Indian. He carries a very thick paperback book entitled Numerology. His eyes are rung with blue makeup, giving him a very exotic and esoteric look. The Swami starts telling me things about me and things I know about, he seems to know. Now the Swami wants to go on to tell me my fortune, which for the most part seems true, except for a few dubious matter. He tells me about wealth to come, seven loves, many women, he said, says after much traveling that I would get together with a girl and we would be done. He said, I will then split and she will marry her own and I will marry in 1973 with four children. Great wealth, happiness. That's not so much. He wants more rupees. So I pay him. He says, I will live to be 84. He says, I will always be a traveler he gives me quite a rosy, healthy picture. I wound up giving him 19 rupees, less than a dollar US, but a lot right now. He said, the sun is good for me. I should be active in the light. The street people were all over him and me, teasing and taunting. He said, I always wanted to do this travel. I really enjoyed his reading of my palm with the lifeline. It was pretty crazy. July 5, 1971, Monday, Kathmandu, Nepal, much hashish, sold in small stores and by many other varied people on the streets, in cafes, etc. It is black and very strong. There's great Western style food everywhere and great rock and roll music to go along with it. Ready for the many Western hippie types to enjoy. I listened to Dylan, Highway 61 Revisited, The Rolling Stones, 
get your yayas out, let it bleed, Woodstock 2, and much more that I'm really enjoying. I go to Swambu, a walk of a few miles in the valley. It's the Monkey Temple, way up on a hill outside town with monkeys all over the grounds. Great shows everywhere with them monkeying around. The stupa and the steps going up are quite an exercise on a hill, but still in the valley. And these freaks here are a real mind blower. Sometimes it's just too much for my head. My mind starts to fry. Last night, there were six very nice looking ladies in the cabin, a place I like to hang out at, a cafe. I look and accept the flow because I feel incapable of the action necessary to try to woo these ladies. The life here is just fantastic. So is this place. Dick, Roger, and I now have a hookah in our room of our own. Wednesday, July 7, 1971, Catmandu. We buy a few grams, one half tola of opium. Good food, music, and great living, but too stoned. 8 July, 1971, Thursday, Catmandu again, a lucky day. Started softly with talking dope I cop in the Tea Room Restaurant, another one of my favorite haunts in Kathmandu. Then working it, pressing it to a good flat shape and sending it off in a letter home. I did a beautiful job of pressing and packaging it. I will send many more while here. It's a nice gesture. Today, I ate a light breakfast and then rented a bicycle. Dick and I drove to Patan, a little sleepy town where I bought four of these white yak leather purses with drawstring closing that our buddy Don had brought the other day and showed it to us. Two for me and one each for Roger and Don. They are very nicely crafted with a wonderful soft leather feel. I come back to Kathmandu from Bhutan and I find three letters at American Express. One from my brother, Alvin, a delightful array of his insanity. I must write him. My mom's letter was zany with all sorts of motherly advice. A girl back home wrote a nice letter indicating she's got a guy she lives with. I feel very good today. I'm a bit stoned. From a letter to my family, 10 July, 1971. What an experience. India is such an incredible land. It disgusts and delights me. Kathmandu is like some place of hippies dream. Hashish, marijuana, and opium are sold in stores with big signs in English. There are really good restaurants here that serve the best food I've had since Western Europe, plus many things better. The West is okay, but banana fritters, banana custard, mashed potatoes, and cheese omelets here are excellent. The food is so good after coming across Asia to get here. No one can figure out how they get all this food together. Get this. In these local restaurants, they have great music. Stones, Beatles, Dylan, etc. After having missed music the way I have, I just sit eating great food, listening to great music, smoking great dope, right in the restaurant and really feeling at home. By the way, the cost of the meal is just 25 cents. There are so many hippie type travelers here. That's what's making it. All this set against ancient pagoda temples that are built everywhere in this ancient feeling land. The people are so simple. It's shocking. But there is such a beauty to this place. It's green and lush outside the city, five minutes away from where I stay. It rains softly here on occasion during each day and it is technically the monsoon season. There are people living throughout the valley and it's small towns to which I walk or ride a rented bicycle. There's a temple here they call Swambu or the Monkey Temple and it overlooks the valley on a hill. As I climbed up the steep high wide staircase leading to the temple up the side of the hill, here I am, all this set in the ancient pagoda temples that are built everywhere. It's wonderful. Next week is week 41. And it's 
all about hanging out in Kathmandu. I didn't get that far, come that far, just to get up and leave. And I would stay as long as I could. Visas were a significant issue, or I would have stayed longer, I'm sure. But I am hanging out in Kathmandu. Come on back for week 41 of the Stevie Wonder 50 years ago. We're taking it week by week, and we're enjoying it. The Wander is a great read. It uses something we call the active voice. It's a hell of a lot of fun. You feel like you're right there experiencing it with our Wanderer. And follow our route of the journey on our website at wandererbook.com. Much hashish is sold in small stores and varied places with people in the streets. The hippie freaks are puffing down wherever we go, smiling, happy, dazed, and stone-faced. Greet us throughout our tour. From a cafe to a tea house to a bar then a restaurant, rock music is everywhere. Bob Dylan, Highway 61 Revisited, The Rolling Stones, Get Your Yaya's Out and Let It Bleed. I really enjoy the atmosphere of Kathmandu and the hippie scene thousands of miles from the West. Good friends, good food, great buzz, wonderful music, far out people, native and travelers alike, and great living. Paul has it all, but I'm too stoned, always stoned, never not stoned. I need to pull back the reins and go with my natural flow. I'm going to capture more time and solitude. I can't tune in with my spirituality if I'm always getting stoned in crowds. I'm in the moment, but I'm not at all present, just barely aware. I'm going to read some more from Zen Master Watts and the Bhagavad Gita, sometimes getting buzzed all the time and be a distraction. I aim to arrive at a balance of karmic equilibrium in my experiences. With these thoughts in mind, I head off on a wandering walk. Monkeys are everywhere around here, especially as I get further from the populated areas and into the hillsides. In fact, there is a monkey temple called Swambu. I've heard so much about it from others that I'm excited to finally check out the monkey temple for myself. Swambu is located high on a hill, just outside of town. As I trek closer to the grounds, monkeys appear everywhere. Near the top of the hill, I take a seat and watch literally hundreds of monkeys swinging through trees and playing around. What a rousing racket of noise they collectively create. 